Yes, please start. All right. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to this present uh, to give this presentation here in, in Kyoto. And my name is Dr. Sven Gamas. I'm a lecturer at Deakin Law School, which is in Melbourne in Australia. And what I want to talk to you about is that the title says A Call to Arms Proposing the Use of Social Science Methods in Transnational Competition Law, which is a bit of a mouthful. It's quite long. And actually, there's a second step to it, what I want to do next. Um, it is very much a, a concept, an idea that I want to talk to you about. And I would like to take you on a journey. Uh, this is a journey that you're all familiar with. This is um, transnational competition law, the problems that we have with it, um, the development over the last few decades. Uh, but I will not go down the beaten path. I will. What I want to look at this issue through a different lens, and I think that's where the contribution of this paper lies. Uh, and the, the novelty lies as well. So the journey is one of transnational or global commerce. We know that now nowadays so firms trade across borders almost frictionless. So there's hardly a merger that is just dealing with a single jurisdiction. They're all global multinational mergers. Any, most of the trade is crossing borders. And what we've seen uh, over the last few decades is a almost privatization of international law. We have um, financial centers like the Dubai Financial uh, International Financial Center, who deals or so almost as a jurisdiction within Dubai which is privatized. It's based on um, traditions, customs, um, the, the privatization of international law. And that is, so trade often tries to sort of take jurisdiction out of, or the state out of trade. They, they deal with it privately in, in arbitration and in dispute resolution. And then we have competition law. And we all know that competition law is deeply rooted in jurisdiction. And we know that we have about 130 or over 130 competition laws around the globe. And that is something that we had to have to grapple with. And that is we, we've tried over the last few decades to find solutions. And the obvious solution one would think, and there is no lack of trying, is to have an, an international competition law code. But we all know, and I'm not stating, I don't want to overstate the obvious, obvious, is that this has failed. We've had the Singapore issues, we've had we have the, the, the proposal by the European Commission of an international competition law code which would, be, would have been binding and multilateral. This idea has failed. We then, even the amendment to just general principles and core principles of competition that one would all agree to under the WTO, this idea has failed. And I don't want to spend more time on that because we, we all know that this has not taken place. However, let's talk about so we talk about the reason, well, it's supposed to be a bit further down, the reason for this uh, failure. And we often talk about the goals, that we have different goals that we're trying to achieve in competition law. There's the argument, and that's often been sort of put forward by so Western nations, especially the United States and Europe, that we should all focus on consumer welfare. Um, but we know that consumer welfare in itself is a rather ambiguous term. And that has shown over the last few years 
that this is a concept in flux. Whereas what has been understood as consumer welfare for argument's sake in the United States uh, is different to what consumer, how consumer welfare is understood in Europe. And that is not even considering other goals. If you look at South Africa, the uh, BEE, the Black Economic Empowerment, uh, and also goals that have nothing to do with what the United States and Europe would see as, as proper competition policy goals, because they're influenced by industrial policy. They're influenced by other reasons that the jurisdictions want to use competition law for. And I think as Eleanor Fox has uh, nicely put it, this is the divergence of these goals is a, con is a concession to reality, that it is what it is. But we tend to look at this from a law and economics perspective. We say, so this is the law, and it's often sort of, and we have um, in trade and in trade negotiations or with technical assistance. So we tend to sort of countries tend to showcase their law and their economic approach to juris to other jurisdictions and persuade them that this is the way forward. How you should apply competition law. Politics is also. Uh, a consideration that we're that we're researching, that we're dealing with, um, but something that we don't really look at is society. And what I mean by society, the, a lot of issues, a lot of aspects can be sort of subsumed under society. I'm talking about a really lo a rather loaded word of culture about values, about sort of not, so why do we use competition law? What do we understand by competition? And it goes even broader, it's sort of society and it's all. The social values that a certain country or like a jurisdiction uses and is deeply rooted in this jurisdiction that influences how law is applied, that influences economics. I mean, this doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum. Evolution in economics and evolution of law and evolution of politics is all rooted in values. And these values are different. So it is important to, so this circle could actually be behind all of this, because society and social values, they are a reflect on the law and economics, and the way we apply it, is only a reflection of the social values, the beliefs, the customs that uh, are prevalent in a society. And this has really been looked at. Well, some have done that. For example, uh, uh, Mel Marquis, has done that for uh, competition law in in Southeast Asia, looking at sort of how Confucian uh, Confucian culture influences the application of competition law, and most recently Julian Pena in Latin America has written a very interesting paper, who's really that really shows the importance of considering social values. And she gives a number of very interesting examples. Some are like similarly the semantic use of a word doesn't have to be the same. So it goes beyond to what we as perceive to be consumer welfare. It is what do we mean by welfare? What do we mean by consumer? What do we mean by competition? What do we mean by law? That already can be different. An example that is very close to home that he uses that is talking about football. If you, if you go to Europe, football clearly is the world game, which is regarding the United States and in Australia as soccer. If you talk about football in Australia, it even depends on which state you are. If you're in Victoria or Melbourne is, 
Football is Aussie rules football, a game that you might not have seen. In Queensland, just across the border, if you talk, if they talk about football, it's rugby. So it's one word meaning something very different. And if people hear this word, they think and believe it means something different. And that is the same potentially with what we perceive to be competition is, what we perceive to be cons consumers are, what welfare is. And we've seen the discussion about welfare and consumers very in much of flex, flux, even in the United States, where we always thought that this is very sort of a settled debate. But apart from the semantics, it's also, it's not the law, it is in the books. It is, and we come back to this idea about lived law. So it doesn't, it, it almost doesn't matter what it says on the books. It is as important as how it is interpreted and how it is applied. And that how individuals interpret law, how individuals apply law, that is influenced by their social, cultural beliefs, whether they're potentially, one way you can think about it is whether you're more an individual, individualist a society or a collectivist society. Issues like whether you sort of, whether harmony is very important to society or loyalty and friendship and relationship. This will, this will have an impact on uh, on the application in competition law. An interesting example that we've, I've just heard about sort of yesterday is sort of the, uh, the discussion of whether leniency would be successful in Japan. Because the idea was, or the belief was that it might not be successful because betraying your business partners is simply not within the culture. Surprisingly, the leniency seems to be rather successful. So this, I'm not saying that this is a the solution to everything, but what I'm saying is that it is important to consider because it will have an impact how competition law is understood, how competition is understood, uh, and how it evolves over time. So if we accept that we have this divergence in competition law, in competition laws, and that this is something that we have to live with, uh, the question is, does it have, does this patchwork of competition law, does it have an impact on the application in the transnational competition law sense, in the application? In other words, does the consequence of this policy diffusion cause friction? And one would assume so. Because if you have um, different laws being applied to the same case or to the same transaction, it's bound to be, it should be, it should lead to different outcomes. And I've picked three examples. One is merger control, one is MA, which is I've called it M&A because it's, I see it as the flip side to merger control. It's like the prime interest of the parties and the law firms and then cartel enforcement. If we look to merger control, the first two, I've just put them on the slide, but we all know them. This call G. Honeywell and McDonnell Douglas and Boeing, those two caused major frictions between the United States and Europe. And I don't want to talk about them any more than that. I just you want to use them as an example for, yes, there can be friction. The two bottom ones are very well known in, in, the, in the Asian realm, in Europe and in the United States, I'm not too sure. One is Job Street and Seek, the merger uh, in, in employment advertising platforms in uh, was Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, similar countries involved in the Grab Uber merger. Both mergers were only notified to the Competition Commission in Singapore 
although the Competition Commission in Singapore know that they had clear implications for the other jurisdictions as well. I know that the reasons for the non notification is not necessarily that the caused by malice by the by, by the companies is simply because um, they believe that, that the job street and signal that wasn't didn't meet certain notification requirements in other jurisdictions. But nonetheless, it had a potential impact in these jurisdictions, but they were not considered for reasons that the law didn't apply to them, or uh, as in uh, Grab Uber, there was a disagreement between the parties and the authorities, for example, in the Philippines. He, Grab Uber Grab is for those who have not been to uh, Asia, it's like the, uh, is a Uber equivalent, Grab is everywhere in Indonesia, uh, it's Grab and Gojek. Um, and Uber left the market and was taken over by Grab. Uh, this was again investigated by the, Sing by the Singaporean authority and they've imposed behavioral remedy. In other countries such as Malaysia and it wasn't, uh, considered under the merger regime because it was regarded as a, a transaction of assets, not a transaction of control, share control. Um, in the Philippines, there was an ex officio um, investigation by the authority, which was only finished after the merger was consummated, after the merger was completed, uh, and they there was only the only way was to grant the also to to clear the merger and then impose and enforce um, any anti competitive anti competitive conduct afterwards. And there's been a number of issues following um, this merger in terms of pricing, in terms of sort of access to the platform. But this is just an example for, is there friction? Yes, but it is not everywhere. And it's not as common as one might think. If we look at m and the key feature here I think is transaction cost. If you think about these uh, sort of multinational or global mergers, two prime examples, SAP, Miller and Imbef, and Fire Monsanto. I will not make any judgment as to sort of the mergers themselves. I just want to use them as an example for what I think in SAB Miller, um, it required 30 law firms and 30 jurisdictions to file, um, to have merger filings. In Fire Monsanto, uh, I uh, found an article that claimed that 80 partners from 80 law firms around the world were involved in this merger to, to sort of see it through, the transaction costs are huge. So, so this, this fragmentation of competition laws from a, on a jurisdictional basis clearly has impact uh, and has a cost attached to it. From the merger control side, from the M&A side, uh, so there is the need and I think the willingness to work together to ease this friction and to limit this friction to support these transactions. Because we all know that most mergers are not uh, controversial and competition authorities look to support and facilitate uh, these kind of transactions to Allow the synergies that the uh, parties claim to 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 feed. If we now look to cartel enforcement, there's one figure that I found staggering. Uh, this is a data set by John and Connor. Uh, he's just uh, constantly updating his data. I think the most recent data says that. 
transnational international cartels have a global overcharge of $24 trillion in the years 1992 to 2019, which I think is staggering. When I saw that number, I, I sort of, I wasn't quite sure whether this is correct, uh, but I, I take it for granted. You know. um, and so there's clear, well, we all know that there's an issue in, in, in cartels, in international cartels. And if you, for example, the South African Competition Authority acknowledges that, especially in this space, more cooperation is needed to work together to minimize the, the impact of international cartels and to do to detect the cartels and also to learn from one another. And this again is a perfect example here. This is a screenshot from the cross-border cartel working group that was initiated by Anktad in 2020 after the uh, competition review conflict. And in this working group, authorities from countries share their experience on how they detected cartels, how they enforce cartels, and share that with their neighboring countries, but also with countries from all around the world and in an effort to come together, learn from one another, and so increase the likelihood to detect and uh, enforce cartel against cartels more efficiently. So this is already the first example of how we're trying to fix this patchwork, which we move to next. So if there is friction and if there is a patchwork, how do we fix this patchwork? And there are a number of ways and means that are employed to do so. And it's again, to a certain extent, stating the obvious, but also uh, highlighting certain aspects that normally do not receive the attention that we believe should. Formal cooperation is the obvious first solution. So we have we, we know that there are bilateral and multilateral agreements uh, between nations. They're, they're initiated by governments to cooperate with one another uh, based on positive comedy in the past, but also to exchange confidential information. The second level is interagency memo memorandum of understanding. Here we take sort of the state or the government almost out of the equation. There were, those are agency to agency uh, agreements. And because we're taking the state or the government out of the equation, we're sort of ensuring that it, the competition law issues are not muddied by industrial policy and other competing interests that a government might have. And is the foundation for cooperation, exchange of expertise and capacity building. And that is very important. They're also the foundation for informal cooperation. Because what, what happens is that sort of, while formal cooperation and convergence is very important, so we haven't gone to convergence yet. Uh, talking about convergence uh, is the next level. Is that, and we know the key players here in the field. So everybody talks about the International Competition Network, UNCTAD and the OECD, and rightly so. There's a lot of convergence happening through peer review, so initially, originally uh, initiated by the OECD, and then also employed by UNCTAD for developing nations, capacity building uh, best, uh, best, and best practice and recommendation. Capacity building is especially for younger authorities, again, that need a, or are looking for a helping hand to develop their national competition laws, which I think is a vital role that the developing nations, especially UNCTAD, is playing. 
And best practice recommendations work really well. And that is one of the key successes of the ICN. There's, I found data that showed that 25% of the ICN members have had major changes to their national competition laws based on these best practice recommendations. So the, the systems are coming together. But they're also, and the reason why convergence is so much appreciated is its non-binding nature, but also the vagueness has its limits. So it's, it, it is not, it's probably not as efficient as it could be because of the trade-off between making it binding and non-binding so that uh, competition authorities can be comfortable that they can almost pick and choose what they believe is appropriate for their jurisdiction. And the third one, so formal cooperation and convergence, is sort of a slow-moving, long-term process. The last one is informal cooperation which is according to um, officials and stakeholders I've talked to happen does happen on an almost daily basis. It is and if you look at um, Phil Marx has once said uh, in, a, in an article saying that, International in an international antitrust talk is actually more valuable than treaty, and that is quite a big statement. So, but attending the IGE conferences uh, and being an observer at the Cross Border Cartel Working Group, uh, these kind of statements are made constantly. So this is another one: trust and relationships are to a certain degree more important than MOUs, or that. Uh, I want to put a name to the face so that I know who to call. So it's almost the like the initiative that the JFGC has started in the ICN, the pick up your phone uh, relationships, the building of these pick up your phone relationships. It is, it is, it is, seems to be a, not a byproduct, but a vital part of everyday competition law enforcement. And while formal cooperation and convergence has, been, has received a lot of attention in academia, there, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ink spilled over these issues, informal cooperation is rarely looked at. And that is what we are proposing. And we want to look at informal cooperation in a very different way. The focal point is the epistemic communities in competition law. And these are just some of them, not all of them, this is some of them. So we have the OECD, we have the ICN and UNCTAD. We also have ASEAN, we have the African Competition Forum and we have BRICS. And these epistemic communities have received attention from academia, but normally they look at sort of how they're set up. How, the, how is the membership? How does it compare? How does the OCD compare to UNCTAD? Um, who are the members? But what we are proposing is to really look at the members, the individuals. So this um, presentation has a little bit um, shifted. We want to look at the individual. We want to look at the enforcer. We want to look at those in competition authorities that enforce the national competition laws on a daily basis in a tra transnational context. Why do we want to do that? And this here comes in the, the social science aspect to um, competition law. We believe that sort of we sh we're sort of lucky because competition law is already rather interdisciplinary. 
I mean, so law and economics, politics is it's well understood and it's done for years. So we have an advantage to other areas of law where we're rather into, in silos and just look at it from a doctrinal basis. But when we look at comparative law, we, we often compare the law. And whereas now, sometimes you see references to context, so we have to put it in context, um, but that it's often put into context of how the society, how the economy is, whether it's a developing nation or whether they're um, protectionists because they, they don't believe in trade liberalization, for example. What we're proposing is to, to look deeper into and go essentially going full circle to the start of my presentation to look into culture. And I've put that in quotation marks because, as I said before, culture is an extremely loaded word. I think there are 170 definitions of culture. And, but it is important to understand not the law, but how it is interpreted, how is it used. And that we can only do if we focus on the individual. We're no longer focusing on the law. So how does the individual um, moving to the how, how does the individual enforce the law? And here we're borrowing from legal anthropology. And so taking an ethnographic approach to uh, the law. And this is very much the, um, the wheelhouse of my uh, co-author, uh, Jeremy Kingsley. And this is the idea about not looking at the law on the page, but the lived law. And in anthropology and an ethnographic approach to law, sort of this is done through observational research. Through Jeremy always talks about the thickness of description by looking at the mundane, the everyday events that take place. And I know this is hard. This is, this is I think, uh, Haas has once described this work as painstaking. Because you also don't know what you will find. But that this kind of approach works and gives you a very deep and insights into the application of the law that you cannot read up in books and you can't achieve by comparing the law. I can show you by an example, and I will again use Jeremy's work in Indonesia. Sorry for the uh, um, slightly uh, wrong formative. I don't know what has happened. Um, he looked. He used to be a corporate a, a corporate lawyer. He, if you would ask him, he would say he's a recovering lawyer. He's now very much a legal anthropologist, and. When he worked in a, as a corporate lawyer in Indonesia, he observed how Indonesian transnational corporate lawyers dealt with their clients. And there was a client uh, that had wanted to establish business relationships with the, with the European counterparts. And when it came to the contract negotiations, the law firm outlined how certain terms of the contract were extremely unfavorable for the client, which was completely ignored by the client. So one would think that the client hasn't understood what kind of risk they're walking into. But then after more, so more observation and discussions, uh, Jeremy realized in this case, it wasn't about risk about the contract as in terms of the contract. It was rather about relationship building. And he's described this as relational contracting. So what was important to the client was having a good relationship, a good long lasting relationship with the counterparts in Europe. And the use of the law firm was actually 
almost to, Jeremy described it as to sanctify the contract, to show that this is very, this relationship is very important to the Indonesian partners. And that you can't pick up if you just look at the contract. This is only if you understand why the individuals, the lawyers, the clients behave in the way they do. And that is what we're proposing. When this is not, essentially this is not radical. This is, we're not saying that law and economics is no longer relevant. Far from it. What we're saying is sort of we should embrace and broaden the interdisciplinarity in competition law and research to go beyond law and economics and to complement it with a social with, with looking at competition law from a social science perspective to gain a deeper understanding on why competition law is applied in the way it is in different jurisdictions. So this is the sort of concept of what we're proposing. And I want to spend a few minutes on the next steps, because I promised you at the start, this is a concept presentation. I want to plant this idea in, in, in your head and hopefully we'll have a lively discussion about it. Um, but I also want to share with you what my next steps are and how I try to sort of put this together and put this into action from a competitional perspective. And I know that observational research is extremely difficult and how that is to be done in a competitional law context, I have an idea, but whether this works, I don't know. But what I have done or what I've already started doing is sort of focus on informal cooperation. Because I know from my own experience, from my discussions with uh, stakeholders at the IGE and UNCAD, uh, observations that I've made during the uh, working group, um, that informal cooperation is a key aspect of competition law enforcement. And I'm interested in how, how are these relationships built that underpin the informal cooperation? Because we know from the anecdotal evidence that sort of they want to put a name to the a face to the name. You wouldn't necessarily, maybe I mean you potentially have to call someone that you don't know, because they if we go back to the uh, convergence and the also the MOUs. There is, if there's an MOU between a number of countries and they exchange information and then, okay, the head of international of the international branch is person X and person Y, and they call each other to find out which parties are dealing with a certain uh, enforcement action that obviously takes place. But I wanted to find out basically were these personal relationships beyond uh, the, the formal, formally established um, business relationships where those take place. And for that, I wanted to look at epistemic communities because that is, but I don't look at epistemic communities as a, as a community itself. It, for me, it's a, it's, a, it's a meeting place. It's like to put it in, I don't, Someone once told me when you go to the IGE in Angtad to the meeting, all the fun happens in the coffee lounge. They inside the formal presentations, but the important stuff happens in the coffee lounge outside. And it's a great place to sit and to watch and to converse with people. And it's the, these meeting points that I want to research. And in that sense, I want to understand how these relationships between individuals from other countries, how are they formed? What makes it a trusting relationship that they feel comfortable with picking up the phone and calling the person if they need help or advice? 
obviously I know that there's no confidential information to be shared, but uh, the helping hand, the understanding how they enforce or how they start a certain investigation, what kind of aspects they are focusing on to, to streamline the enforcement and make it quicker and better. Uh, and this takes place on a daily basis. Uh, and what I've done is being in Australia, I thought, let's look to our closest neighbor. And our the most important region for us is ASEAN. This is all our neighbors. And ASEAN is a, is a network of, of numerous competition authorities and the ACCC in Australia has a vested interest in this region. They, they're actively assisting in cooperation with Australia, but also amongst ASEAN. And there is some, uh, there's a problem called CLIP, the Competition Law Implementation Program, uh, where Individuals and enforcers from ASEAN competition authorities are seconded to the HFLC offices in Australia. And they, they spend a couple of months seconded to the authority and they meet and they meet one another and they live with one another and they go out with one another. Uh, and so they form a personal bond. And I want to find out how these, how this bond has been created and whether it is lasting. And for that, I started an interview study with interviewing uh, individuals from competition authorities uh, in ASEAN that are partially been CLIP scholars, so been seconded to Australia, but some of them are also have not had this experience within CLIP, but obviously also have created relationships with their counterparts in other venues, in other meeting places. And what I want to find out is what are these meeting places and what makes a good relationship? Because my argument is that sort of to have fruitful informal cooperation and we trust your counterpart, it is important that you have a good personal relationship. So it is, I'll, I'll almost look at this establishment of relationships through the lens of competition law. I'm using my network and uh, my knowledge in competition law to talk to these individuals about how they make friends. And these are very difficult questions and they sometimes are surprised by the question. But it, I want to understand, so what works and what doesn't work in the hope that the, the grand goal is to almost have a little guide on the do's and don'ts, how to build relationships in a competition law network and where to go and, and assist potentially sort of younger competition authorities in sort of increasing the likelihood that they are having a meaningful and good relationships that they can rely on in the future. And another example, I've had the pleasure to do over the last week. And that was here in Japan. Uh, I, I was uh, invited to attend the JICA training that is run in conjunction with the JFTC, uh, which is a three week program, a roughly three week program. And the attendees for this uh, program, I think they're in the public domain, so it's no problem sharing the countries. Uh, it was Indonesia, Serbia, Ukraine, Ghana, Kenya, and Mongolia. And these individuals from these competition authorities, they've spent, again, they've lived at JICA at their uh, centers. And for three weeks, they were trained in Japanese competition law, but they also shared their own experiences from their country. And interestingly, these individuals, although they were from the, from the same region, they had never met before. And you could see how these relationships had built over the period of those three weeks. So that is yet another meeting place 
where these relationships are formed. And this is what I want to focus on for the next few years. So this is almost like a research agenda, this presentation. This is, this is, this is why it's called a call to arms. This is something that I was initially deeply uncomfortable with because it forced me to go outside my comfort zone and think about law in a very different way. Uh, but I've seen working with Jeremy uh, how fruitful that can be and how powerful the results can be. I say can be because I don't know whether it will happen, but I'm trying. And uh, in the hope that I can play a little part in sort of understanding transnational competition. I don't think that we will have ever have um, a global competition law. For that, I mean, it, it becomes more divergent by the day. While we have convergence, there are new competition law authorities added, there are new discussions to be had, as we can see in the United States. Uh, there's, there are too many dials working. And at the same time, if you have, if you think about it, if you have convergence, but also very good informal cooperation and cooperation, there is no need for an supranational, international competition law. Why would a country impose a new set of laws uh, with a new jurisdiction or like with a with, with a new sort of body, international body that now deals with matters on competition law, if the second best option that we've developed over years seems to work really well. But I think it's important to further understand how this second best option works and how we can further improve it. And with that, Thank you very much.